All right, we are working uh, today on chapter six. Last week we talked um, about chapter five um, and really a, a lot about web design uh, and how you know you kind of approach the whole thing um, and some really like more kind of like a higher level overview of how you proceed. And the reason that we're doing that at this point in, in the semester is as we get to the content like we're about to go into, we're going to be looking today at a thing called the CSS box model. It's a really important concept in uh, web page design. And then we're also going to look at things that start to help control the layout of what we're doing. So we're going to move away from some more simplistic layouts to slightly more complex ones and how we're going to like accomplish those things often first requires planning before you can uh, do these things. So in other words, if you're going for a certain visual look on a website, it kind of helps to know where you're going first. So that's why in chapter five, they start talking about things like wireframing and knowing your audience and what colors you select and, and uh, all the best practices and stuff that they were mentioning. Um, you know, I do have these two chapters combined in into one, um, and sometimes I kind of second guess myself whether or not that's really a good idea, but I, I, I think it is because I think they are interrelated. Um, even though it stretches over two weeks, you know, we're still in the same unit, and therefore some of the due dates and stuff are kind of aligned with that. Um, anyhow, uh, let's go ahead and, and proceed uh, with this stuff. Now, I, I do know that we're going to be doing some coding today, so I want to be a little preemptive. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the folder where I've been storing my work. And you see that's my, my Unit 4 folder here. I'm just going to click in there really quick. And I have been uh, working on this, you know, Mr. Robot thing, and it's all in the root of this folder. So I don't want to change or lose anything I've done so far. And I am working for homework in a different unit folder, so I'm going to go ahead and, and do uh, basically a primitive versioning of my work. So I'm going to copy this folder, and then I'm just going to paste it back into the same folder. All right. And then I'm going to adjust the name of it once it appears. So I'm going to rename it to be Unit 5, as soon as my system decides to respond. So this is Unit 5. No spaces, all lowercase. I'm sticking with that convention. Now, um, here in class, just before we did this, we were going through the whole launch page thing. So one thing I'm going to do when I'm all done is I'm going to make sure that this Unit 5 stuff gets uploaded there. And one of the reasons I'm going to be doing that every week is if you guys want to look at my examples from class and how I did stuff, you can always look at the code I did in class. And instead of me, like, zipping it and putting it into the course shell, isn't it a lot easier to just go to the website? And you can just right click view source. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. So now that I have created a version, I'm, I am going to go over to my editor here and I'm going to make sure that I, that I refresh my view. Is there a refresh here somewhere? I always forget where they put it in Dreamweaver. Do, 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 do. Do you guys, oh, there it is. Refresh. There we go. And I'm going to be working on my site. I'm just going to go up go ahead and preemptively open up my index.html file and my my style sheet. I'm just going to have both of those uh, open. And actually, here's what Dreamweaver does for me. It Whenever it pulls in a file and anything that's linked, automatic, it automatically gets pulled in with it. So I do already have it available. That's neither here nor there. Um, just so you know. All right. I'm going to jump over to the PowerPoint now. We do have a bunch of topics to cover here. And some of these are, are you know, critically important in this field. Um, and we'll spend, you know, maybe uh, a good chunk of time talking about this box model thing. That's one of the first things that comes up. Uh, and as you start working with the box model, then you start to learn all the little subcomponents that go with it. So we're going to start working with margin. So far, we've played a little bit with the a feature called padding. We've also played with borders. 
and margin is basically the last piece of the box model we haven't played with yet, which is kind of interesting. So we start like playing with the pieces before we actually learn what it is. But it's a critical concept and when you're doing layouts. And some, some really important techniques you're going to learn. Another thing you're going to learn is a, a thing called float. And that is where objects kind of dynamically move around in certain ways and you can kind of control it. Uh, we're going to learn about different types of positioning. Um, fixed, relative, and absolute. Uh, we're going to learn about doing uh, multi-column layouts uh, using CSS, which is something you see on many websites. Um, and just a kind of a note on that, as we move into subsequent chapters, they'll start to add different layouts as we go and show you the basic code and approach for accomplishing it, which I think the book does a very nice job of. So if you have a certain type of look you're going for, maybe on your personal project site or something that you're building later on. They have like, here's the basic code to get there and here's the basic CSS to get there. Uh, and then, you, you know, you can tweak the rest. Um, we're also going to start looking at uh, navigation using unordered lists and styling it with CSS. And then we're going to talk about the pros and cons of that. Um, we're also going to start putting some interactivity on our hyperlinks using a a little aspect of CSS called pseudo classes. Um, and then we're going to start uh, configuring HTML5 structural elements. And I know I mentioned in the, in the previous video that we did, the launch page video, that HTML, its main uh, point since it became HTML5 is to convert us over to what we call the semantic web, where the tags we're using have meaning relative to the content that we're building and we're trying to take a lot of unnecessary frivolous code out of the HTML uh, and putting it into other places. Um, but we're going to learn about these structural elements um, that are kind of new to us, but that really uh, help a lot with layouts. And those are uh, some tags called section, article, and aside. And those were uh, brand new elements when HTML5 came out. Um, and I think they're very useful ones in some regards. So those are the things that are kind of our on our agenda. All right, let's uh, let's dig in and start talking about the box model. And this is, you know, if there's any one huge takeaway in this chapter, this is it. You know, probably one of the most important things you're going to learn. Um, and this is one that you kind of need to latch on to. And they have a nice little graphic here, and, and I'm going to say little because it is kind of on the small side. So I'm going to make my screen just ever so slightly bigger. And then I want you to look at this graphic. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on it like I often do. I'm going to make it a little bigger so we can see it a little bit more clearly. Um, and talk about this a little bit. So you notice that with they have this like structure here that is existent. And, and this is a really important thing. Any object you put on the screen basically exists in a box. A rectangular box of some sort. So when I say content, that can be anything. That can be an image, it can be a paragraph, a div, one of these HTML5 structural elements, an unordered list, an H3, whatever it is we're putting on the screen, everything that is content based will have the content component. So, you know, if it's just words on the page and they sit inside of a paragraph tag, that's the content. You might not see any of these other things sitting around it natively, but you guys notice like when we first started doing our HTML and we put a paragraph in, we put a paragraph in and we keep typing text, it all kind of just sits there in a blob. And then when we put a new paragraph in, there's a space in between the paragraphs. Well, that spacing in between the paragraphs is dictated by the box model. When we dropped an H1 in, okay, well, yes, the letters are bigger and bolder, but you, an H1 and an H2 and an H3, they all have a little bit of space around them also. And that is to create more of a visually pleasing approach to the content that we're using. So some items that you're going to use in HTML will have pre-configured aspects in the box model that you as a designer can override through code. Okay? Sometimes you might not choose to, but most designers that want to get a pixel-perfect layout, like something that looks good on every screen, 
will typically override all of these settings by default and then build them back in themselves. Okay, you, we'll see how that's done. So, um, But if you think of any piece of thing that we're putting on the screen, there'll be the content itself. So typically, let's say it'll be words, okay, for most of the stuff that we're going to be doing. The content will basically fill that box precisely and then sitting around it are these other invisible elements you normally don't see. There will be padding, there will be a border, and there will be a margin. And you notice that in the diagram, the author shows us that there's a top, right, bottom, and left. And as we've learned with a lot of CSS styles, you can control each one of these items, the margin, the border, and the padding, individually on the top, right, bottom and left. That's the point of having it listed there. And we did that a little bit. So like I, like when I was doing the Mr. Robot thing, I put like on, I think the subheader, the due into my machine that I'm pushing it quite that hard. Maybe it's the video recorder that's creating this video. I'm not quite sure. Um, but let's talk about it. Okay, so the content, per the authors, he says the text and web page elements in the container. So you see in the, in the diagram, it sits right in the middle. The padding is the area between the content and the border. Some HTML elements have pre-configured padding. That's important to know. Some don't, some do. Then there's the border. Well, that's a spot that we can put in that surrounds an item, and we, we've kind of played with that, so we've put it around like H1s and other things. And that can help to create definition to your object. On the outside of that border is an additional spacing element, that's the margin, and that determines the amount of space between whatever you're working with and the next adjacent object. So whenever we put anything on the screen, we kind of have these three layers of control with any object. And they're useful in various ways. So like for example, if I ever put a border on something, what I typically do is make sure I also put some padding on it because it never looks good if like words are touching a border around them. I think they need a little bit of space. And we kind of did that like on the Mr. Robot page and I'm trying to do the, uh, the preview mode here. See my mouse is like even choking. Something's going on in the background uh, here that's really so I'm going into design mode. So this is the one nice thing about Dreamweaver is I can kind of see the result beforehand, right? But, you know, each one of these objects, so like the, the menu, for example, has, you know, all the elements that sit around it. This here is a border that sits around uh, or just on the bottom of that H2 or whatever it is. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. All right. The way that we're going to learn how to play with this is to actually play with it. So you, you kind of have to start writing some code in order to see the effects of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create kind of like a, a scratch page. Um, so I'm going like to copy one of my pages, create a, a junk play page just to screw around with code, and then I'm going to start adjusting uh, some of these things as we go. So let me do that work first. So I'm going to actually go into my file manager here, and that's not where I want to be. I want to be here. I'm going to go into my unit 5. Here's all my pages. You know, I'm going to actually copy the about page because that one's kind of like devoid of content right now, so it'll be kind of like a, a useful one to copy. And I'll paste it back in. I'm going to rename it, and I'm just going to call it code-examples, that's what I'm going to call it. You guys want to call it something else, that's fine. I'm going to jump back over to my editor here, and I think I figured out this is how I do my refresh, and there's my code examples page, so I'm going to double click that and open it. So this is what that looks like right now, that's what's in there because I made a copy of one of my other pages. 
I'm going to switch back over uh, to source code view. And you know what? We have an image in there. I'm not really um, too worried about that image of the flowers. So I'm actually just going to kind of remove that because I, I want the screen space for other stuff. But I do have, this is the about page and I think that's okay. So let's, let's leave that paragraph in there. Uh, except maybe we'll say this is the code example page. All right, and then I'm going to play with basically the same code they're showing us in the book or in the PowerPoint here. And so they're putting in an H1 and they're playing with the margins around it. Now, in order to really demonstrate this properly, folks, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually create a couple of paragraphs and put them in here just to have content to work around. Then I'm going to go ahead and create an H1. One, and it could be anything. It could be, you know what, you want to do an H2, do H2. And then I'm going to say, this is my H2 example. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and save it. And I'm going to show you uh, a couple of aspects here real carefully. So they're, they're going straight to the margin property. But I, there's a little bit of an issue here, and I'm going to show you what the issue is. The issue is that we're kind of not really seeing the space that the H2 is occupying right now, because when it does, when we, when we do go ahead and render it on the screen, and so I'm actually going to do the, uh, the preview and browser thing, so you can just open yours up. Oh, don't I don't even have that configured on here. That's okay. I'll go to my other folder. I don't want to mess with it right now, so I'll just double click it from my folder, which is probably what you guys are doing anyhow. And there it is, okay? So this is my H2 example. Wait a second, that H, well, that's a really messed up H2, isn't it? Because the style I had for this H2 is now applying to this one. Okay, that's a little problematic. So let me fix that first. So I'm going to look at my style sheet and say that my H2 yeah, see, I don't want that border bottom thing for all of my H2s. I don't think that looks really good. So let's go back to the index page for a second. Let's look at this code. For the H2. And it does have a class that says hacked, right? That's what I put. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move a few styles around. So I did notice that here somewhere I had a style called hacked. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take these two things that give it that look and remove it from the H2 declaration and just put it on that particular class. Now remember, this is going to apply to all the pages automatically because they're all sharing the same CSS file. So let's just take a really quick look in the browser to just make sure that that fixed Okay. Well, it kind of broke it a little bit, right? And I'm wondering why, because that's the code example page. Oh, I and I, I understand why. Okay. So, because this one doesn't have the class declaration. And then I'm going to guess that none of my other pages do too. So I just want my, my site to look consistent. So what I'm going to do is going to open up all the pages and make sure that all my H2s with the, that, that tagline thing have the same class indicator on it. And what else do we have? About. So now as I flip through each one of the pages, an index, okay, they're all the same. I'm going to go ahead and do a save all, just to save all the files at once. I'm going to go back to the browser and just verify that it actually worked correctly. Once again, everything seems to be running a little sluggishly here. Um, I maybe have too many things going on. I may start closing some tabs in the background, just so you know. Uh, but let's do a refresh and see that it's fixed so that the tagline one is fixed. 
Let's make sure it looks good on all the pages. Well, I don't have a gallery yet, but I am missing a link to my code page, aren't I? Let's go ahead and add that in right now. So I'm going to add it into my navigation area. I still have like a blank gallery thing, but I'm going to create um, a duplicate of this link here. And what's the name of the file? Code. See how it figures it up for me automatically? I just love it. Um, and then I'm going to change the, the link, of course, to, to say uh, code examples. Of course, I want that line um, in all my navigations, on all my pages. So I'm going to copy it. And then I'm just going to go page by page and paste it in. Putting it right in the same spot on each page. And yes, if I was persnickety, I'd make sure all of them lined up perfectly. But right, once again, I'm going to do a save all. Let's go back to the browser and take a look. Did they, did they actually save? They sure did. All right, let's do a refresh. See, now I have code examples on my menu. Is it on every page? Looks like it is, right? So it looks like we're fine. But I'm going to go just bring that one up in the browser now. And then I want to start making a couple of uh, adjustments to my H2. So here, um, now that we're on the code examples page, we got that all figured out, and I'm going to be looking at my CSS quite a bit. I'm, I'm trying to figure out why is the text so wide on this? What is making it so wide? You guys remember what the styling element was for that? So somewhere I have some word spacing going on here that is, I think, a little inappropriate. Now, Ethan just texted it over. <laughs> Thank you. He said, Gesundheit. Yeah, so it looks like I had like a secondary style for H2. You guys seeing this down here? Right. Once again, I don't want that on all H2s, do I? No, I just want it on that one. So I'm going to cut it out of here, find my hacked, and paste it in. The beauty of, remember, the beauty of CSS, it's fi fix all the pages, not just this page, but all the pages. All right, now I can go back to that particular H2. And you know what? <clears throat> Let me ask you this. Is it smart of me to apply, because I'm going to play with like margins and spacing now, to apply the same style to all my H2s, that's not really very smart. So here's what I'm going to do instead. I know that the book is giving you the example on the H2, but I'm going to opt instead to do this. I'm going to go to my source code, and on the H2 I'm trying to style, I'm going to put in a class and say, uh, I'm going to call it test, you know, actually I'm going to call it test spacing. Okay, on purpose, and then I'm going to create a style based on that in my in my CSS. I'm going to put it. You know what? I'm going to put it way at the bottom. And because it's a class, it's going to start with a dot. And I'm going to pa paste it in. Oops, I got a double quote in there. That's not good. Let's get rid of that. And then let's put in our, our curly brackets. Now we can start playing. The first thing I'm going to do to demonstrate the complete box model to you, this is, and to me this is important so you can see it, is I'm just going to put a border around it, and I'm going to make it one pixel solid black. All right. Let's save it, and let's go take a look. 
And you know what? I better save my source code page too. So I'm saving my CSS and I'm saving my HTML. When you're in an uh, environment where you can have multiple files open, most of those programs will also have a save all feature. And that's something you might want to get into the habit of knowing the shortcut key for it. Like in Dreamweaver here, if I want to do a save all, well, they don't even have a shortcut key for it. So guess what I'm doing? <laughs> right, I'm going to the menu each time. Some programs will also have, like Notepad++, they'll have a little icon where they have one picture of, a, of a, like a floppy disk and that's save. Then they have like two floppy disks and that's save all. Just so you know. Other IDEs do have shortcut keys for save all. Apparently Dreamweaver doesn't. Um, all right, well that's the first strike against Dreamweaver, I see. But here, let's do a refresh now and take a look at what we've created. So take a look at the H2 and how it sits on the page. And notice that we have now a border that sits around it. And what's really nice about this is it's showing us the box model in effect. First of all, the H2 element, H2 tag, is what we call a block level element, meaning that whatever thing it sits inside of, it occupies the full width of it. Okay, That's why it goes all the way over to the right margin. Now you can also see that if I zoom in in particular, so let's do that for as obnoxious as that is, you can see that this basically occupies the content area. The words occupy the content area almost edge to edge. So there is a little bit, maybe there's a one pixel space right here between the T and the border, maybe. Then I look at the P down here and it looks like about the same. Like if I really zoom in, and this is kind of obnoxious, right? Okay, that's maybe like two pixels, but that's, I mean, I can see a little bit of white there, but that's one pixel. So it really does fill the content area. However, it is showing me one thing, that at the top of the H2, there is a little bit of spacing. I don't know how many pixels that is. It might be five, 10 pixels. So apparently, an H2 by default has five to 10 pixels of padding at the top, and despite whatever it's doing to the font. Okay? Now, just to refresh, and, and I'm gonna be working predominantly with a style sheet here, that padding can all be controlled, right? So if I decide to say 20 pixels of padding, and with this command, it'll go all the way around, I'm not designating sides, just all the way around. Save, refresh. Okay, so there's 20 pixels. I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit so you see it kind of more like this. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add in the margin aspect that I want you to pay really careful attention as we do this to the fact that a paragraph has a little bit of space above it and below it. A little bit of space above and below it. And now we're going to throw in this margin aspect. And like with padding, right now I'm not going to designate sides. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a certain amount of it to the whole thing. So I'm going to choose to go 25 pixels on this, make it a little more than the padding. I'm going to save it, and then very carefully watch the screen as I do the refresh. Okay, Control R to refresh. Do you see what happened? Now I want to I want to make it like kind of a little more dramatic here because I think that it's easy to miss what's going on. So I'm going to comment it out and save it, refresh it. This is what it was. And I want you to pay careful attention. I mean, it was pretty clear to me that it moved over from the left margin a little bit, right? Did you also notice that it moved here? So I'm leaving my mouse. See where, where I'm leaving my mouse right at the top of the border? I'm going to go back. And I'm going to do this with the keyboard now, not the mouse. 
so I don't lose my mouse position on the screen. Save it, flip back, mouse is still at the top of the border. To control our watch, what happens? Not exactly what you would anticipate, right? Yeah. Not exactly what you would anticipate. It is clearly creating a margin, but somehow it's interacting with the paragraph in an unpredictable kind of way. And what I always tell students is margin is a useful tool, but it can be a little unpredictable because it does change the flow of the document in kind of unpredictable ways. So if I caution you against like, you know, which one is better to use, padding or margin, I'm always going to say padding is a little safer to use because you can put a border around something temporarily and see what it does, where margin often breaks the flow of the document. We'll learn what that, what that means. But it does create spacing next to adjacent objects. I can make it a little more dramatic. And let's try some of the techniques they're pointing out in the book. So the book is going through and they're saying, well, there's the approach where you can just declare one value and it puts it around the whole thing, hypothetically. Okay? But then I can also do this approach where I can say top and bottom, left and right. Well, that's kind of redundant if they're both the same value. So let's make, um, let's actually make the left and right 25. Let's make the top and bottom 50. Save it. Let's go back, do a refresh, watch the screen real carefully. This is important. That added a little bit more of the effect that we, that we were probably hoping to see. All right, let's go back again, and this time, notice, as I, this is the beauty of using a product like this. When I just use the two values, it shows me what I'm doing, right? But maybe we want to make these all kind of unique. So it's top, right, bottom, let's go really dramatic, 100 pixels, and then left, let's make that 40 pixels. Let's make them all different. Let's save it, go back and refresh. Refreshing. Isn't that interesting, right? How we're adjusting the spacing. Now I want to show you guys a tool I haven't really showed you yet, or haven't showed you much. And this is going to become a tool that's going to become a standard. Um, it's kind of like carrying a Swiss Army knife for web developers. Okay? And it, you know what? It's built into your browser. And whether you're using Firefox or Chrome, and you know most of us are using Chrome, uh, by default, but I, I will give you a little bit of a tip that this tool in Firefox is actually a little bit better than the Chrome tool. Although they both keep improving so rapidly, it's kind of hard to keep track at times. I'm going to show you a tool uh, called the Inspect Element tool. And before I do that, I'm going to actually reset my zoom to 100%. So I can either go up to the menu here, and I know I'm zoomed in right now, and, and hit the minus sign. But here's the shortcut key for resetting your zoom in a browser. Hold down control and zero. That puts you back to 100%. Do you know how you zoom in with the keyboard? Control plus, control minus, control zero, back to 100%. Yeah, that is pretty nice, Ethan. Ethan just chatted nice. Yeah, that's pretty nice. So these are the kind of little things that you learn. Now, the inspect element tool is kind of like view source. So let's talk about that first. So like in the old days of doing browser stuff, they had this view page source. And the fact that you could right click and see the code that creates the page was kind of like, wow, that's awesome. I can do it too, you know? Um, but then, you know, developers, um, and, and this happened first in Firefox, by the way. Um, they came up with this tool in Firefox called Firebug. And what Firebug allowed you to do is dig a little bit deeper into your code and also look at your JavaScript console, which you guys will learn in a separate class. Uh, but they added this thing called inspect. So if you do a right click on a blank spot of a page, or even better yet, a right click directly on top of the element that you want to inspect. So I right clicked right on top of the H2, and I'm clicking inspect. And then it will open up a panel. And it'll either open up on the side or the bottom and you can control the position of that and if you're a multi-screener which I usually am when I'm doing this kind of work 
is you can actually tear this off and move it to wherever you want. But here's the beauty of it. The H2, notice right there, right? I clicked it, and right away on the right-hand side over here, it highlighted it. Now notice what happens when I move my mouse on top of the code. So the top part of the code box here is a breakdown of the code. And, and I will tell you that if you change your, your layout, and I forget how to do it. So for a lot of you, it may have popped up like this, maybe. Um, depends on how big your screen is. I'll, I'll tell you like which, which uh, view you prefer to use. I, lately, I've been preferring to use the, the side view for most things. Um, but as you find any element inside what we call the DOM, okay, so uh, let's, let's talk, you're learning a lot of concepts here all at once. So the first part of this is the breakdown of your HTML document. As you like move over the different aspects in your code, so all your code is here in the hierarchy, it highlights the different items. So notice as I hover over paragraph, not only does it show me the paragraph, but it also shows me the built-in styling or whatever styling we put in on that object. And if you look at the, at the far right over here, so I'm gonna I have to move my mouse over to show you, right? It shows me on my H2, this is the content, this is the padding, this is the border. That's really thin, so you can't barely see it, but here's the margin. And if I hover over the element, if you look over at that same little diagram, it shows you all the values. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was right. Now let me take you to the next step of wow. Here's the beauty of this tool. So you got stuff up in your browser and you're troubleshooting it, right? And you're sick of flipping back and forth to your code editor, doing a save, refreshing your browser, right? To see it, like how to get the stuff just right. Here's what you can do. Notice that as that H2 is highlighted, over here, it also has a style panel, right? And do you see what happened? I'm hovering over the style panel and it shows me all the same styles that we were creating in the style sheet. And notice how there's like little check boxes. Guess what I can do? I can turn off the border. I can take away the padding. I can take away the margins. And I can take it even one step further. I don't like the color of the border. I think red will look better. Boom, I got red. In fact, I, I'd rather make that, um, you know, five pixels. I just did it. Now, this is not changing my source code. This is just changing what's in the browser. So it allows me to try out concepts before I actually write it into code. You know how useful that is? That is immensely useful. I mean, it is crazy useful. And then when you're playing with like these margins in particular and the spacing, and then when you can actually see the margins and what they do to your content, you can come in here and just start tweaking stuff and saying, you know, that 100 is obnoxious. I'm going to go down to like, you know, 30. That works for me. So you see like the advantage of this, right? Yeah, no, and it doesn't, doesn't seem like that would be the effect that you would get. But here, let's be, let's be obnoxious again, put in 123, 12, 66. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly, you know, Joe's catching on to it. And, and I think it's because you, get a, you have a little more coding background than the others. But if I, if I look at like where that margin sits right now and how it bumps up against the two paragraphs next to it, but then I move my mouse up to the paragraph thing, do you notice that the paragraph also apparently has some sort of a, a margin of 18 is like the default for it. But if my eye served me right, the H2, yeah, the mar here's a trick with margins, folks. Margins of adjacent objects will overlap. 
Yeah, that that can be problematic because you got to account for that overlap. So if I know there's an 18 pixel margin on the paragraph and I'm adding a 50 pixel margin to my H2, that means I'm in essence kind of canceling out 18 pixels because it's built into the thing. So I got to compensate by adding 18 more if I really want to move it that much. The, the beauty of the inspect tool is this allows you to come in, look at your page in the browser, tweak the numbers, and once you got the numbers tweaked, yeah, grab them and put them back into your code. Yeah, can you do that? Sure can. You just come in here and just, you know, highlight it and grab it and copy paste it in. It's not a big deal. All right, so that, that's the inspect tool, but it also demonstrates margin, padding, and border. And it shows you that we have these tools here built right into the browser that help us work at the box model and see it. Now this is Google Chrome's approach to doing this. I strongly urge you guys to check out Firefox too. And, and maybe, uh, maybe even later today I'll switch browsers and you guys can see the inspect tools in there. I think they're slightly superior to Chrome's. Um, the other thing I should mention too is that, you know, I'm not in that mode in Dreamweaver, but if, in Dreamweaver, if I'm in, um, you know, in a, in a view mode, uh, so if I go into, well, if I turn off the code mode and go to, let's say live mode, where it shows me what the browser would actually make it look like, it also has um, the CSS designer panel, right? that has some of these tools built in. And if I want to adjust, for example, the padding in my H2, wa watch what I can do here with this tool. I can just kind of just change it like this and see a change in the browser. It's pretty slick, right? Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing actually. And then when you start to learn that you can do it, like if I got my, my pixel here, I can just change stuff on the fly see the live result, you know, when I, and when I let go and I go back to my code, so if I go back to code mode, it's already changed it in here. Yeah. All right. So that's why, that's another reason, like, why, like, people, especially do front-end design work for HTML, love this product. That CSS tool is kind of the bomb. However, if you don't have a tool like that, you still have the inspect tool in the browser that kind of gives you the same thing. You just have to copy paste the code back. But you can see the effect in the browser and that's huge. It's huge. All right, let's move on. We've only gotten two slides in so far, but we actually have learned a lot. We already have played with the padding a little bit, right? I think we're probably pretty comfortable with that. Padding goes inside the border, margin goes outside the border. Margins can overlap, right? One thing that I will tell you guys, though, is whenever you're doing this stuff and you're trying to figure out how to fit stuff on screen, you sometimes actually have to pull out a calculator and start measuring. You know, well, if I got like this many pixels to work with and this guy has this much padding and that much padding and this much border and this much margin, how much do I need to, you know, and some of it's a matter of experimenting so the visual tools help, but sometimes you have to actually do calculations to make sure that your layouts don't break. So just a helpful tip. All right. Let's talk about the box model in action. So really what they're doing here is kind of showing you what I was just showing you. But here's, here's the thing that you might want to consider doing on your code. So, and notice we're gonna learn a, a very important technique in CSS. And the important technique is the wild card. What's a wild card? It's a joker, right? <laughs> but in, in code, a wild card is, in this case, and I'm just going to copy this right into my code. So I'm going to show you the effect of it, and it might break my entire layout. I'm just telling you that right up front. Okay? I'm going to put this way up at the top because it's kind of a global thing, so I like to see it at the top, that it is global. But the wild card, the asterisk, basically says, I'm applying this to everything that's got a box model on it. So all the styles are getting this. And it says box sizing border box. Well, let's go back to the slide and read what that means. 
Okay, the default value for width or height is the value for only the content, not including the border and padding. Are you guys catching that? Okay, so if I put in, let's say, a div, and I say it's 400 pixels across and 100 pixels tall, that means it's not counting the border. So if the border is 5 pixels all the way around, i got to add 10 more pixels. If the padding is 20 pixels all the way around, i got to add 40 more pixels to the width. You kind of seeing what I mean? So you have to count that. What the box sizing property does is this. If you declare an object to be 400 pixels, it bundles in the padding and the border to that measurement. And so a lot of designers love to use this because then you don't have to sit there and do math. Because I'll tell you what happens when you do math. is like, you'll say, well, there's five pixels here and five there and 20 here and 20 here and 30 there and whatever. And then sometimes you forget to add one in and it breaks your layout and you're like, what the hell happened? And this way, you can just say, well, this whole thing with the borders and the padding and whatever is all this size. So I think it's a really wise one to use. Strongly recommend it. Okay. The other thing I'm going to show you that's, that's a wild card, and I don't know like uh, when the author actually presents it or in what chapter, is this. When I do designs and I want them to lay out perfectly the way I want them to, I do what I call an override of all the default styles. So you already saw like a paragraph, I didn't put any styles on it, has a built-in margin, right? But I'm always fighting that. I always have to account for it. I always have to remember there's an overlap, all that kind of stuff. So what I do is this. I will come in here and say margin zero. Padding zero. Order. Zero. Okay, so now let me tell you what this does. This clears away all the predefined styles on any elements that have them for those three categories. However, when I go back and look at my design in just a moment, you're going to see that some things moved and broke. So then I have to go back in. And if I want that spacing in there, I have to manually control it. But from a design standpoint, this is stuff that you should put, I think, in all of your designs. That's my personal preference. Like when I do work, this is a given. It's automatic. I just automatically do this. And then I know that I'm gonna have to add stuff back in. Let's do a control S to save. Let's go back to the browser and check the monstrosity we've just created. I'm going to do a refresh. Anticipating things are broken. Right? Anticipating some things are broken. But you know, not too bad. Could have been worse. Right? Could have been worse. Right? Not too bad. So there's, I see some things that are wrong um, and that I'd probably want to fix. But, you know, did my border go away for this? Let's go back to inspect, because this had a bottom border, right? So it still says the border is there. And see how I'm clicking it on and off and it's moving? It's still there. The problem is, is there's no spacing in between these. So what I probably want to do with that particular hacked style is add in, I don't know, some margin. So let's do that. So I'll, I'll go, I'll find hacked. I'm just going to throw in. Uh, and probably what I'll do is I'll go margin top 10 pixels, margin bottom, I might make that 15 pixels, save it, let's go back and take a look and refresh, let's go take, okay, that's a little better, right? We're, we're, we're going to fix that Mr. Robot logo, don't worry about it for right now, but that's what happens if you do use those overrides where you put in the globals, Sometimes you have to go back in and add some stuff it back in to make it look okay. And at, at first that feels like, why would you do that? It was looking good. The why is so that you have pixel perfect control over what you're seeing on the screen, not the browser. 
you have the control. And from a design standpoint, when you spend a lot of time trying to nail down a design, you don't want the browser coming in, throwing in its own styles and breaking your stuff. That's the why. Because you know what? Every browser, I mean, most of them have the same settings, but there's a couple that don't. Yeah. So, that's, <laughs> that's kind of the why. Let's move on in the PowerPoint. So that's highly recommended. I know at some point they talk about padding zero, margin zero, border zero. It's called a reset. Um, in fact, there's, there's actually ones that you can go out to the web and completely download. Uh, there's a, some standard ones that people kind of use in the industry. Um, but at the very least, I recommend using those. All right, let's talk about the normal flow and let's talk about um, creating things of certain sizes and you're going to see a little bit more of how uh, this works. And, and I think this is a really important concept as well that you kind of latch on to. So the, what they're doing here on the screen is they have a bunch of uh, objects that they're creating and in order to do the demonstration, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some of those objects just so you can see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a few divs, okay? And the reason I'm using divs is divs are generic block level HTML elements that have no pre-attached styles. That's why designers love to use them because they're kind of a blank canvas. They're not bringing any margins, paddings, or borders with them automatically. No font sizes are pre-declared, okay? So I'm going to create uh, several of them and I'm going to do this on top of it. Whenever I create a div, I always give them an ID to make them unique. So I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm just going to say box one, right? And then the other thing I do with divs is I always put a comment after the closing div like this and say end box one, which I think I already kind of taught you. It's just a convention that I use. Because when you get a whole bunch of them and they start nesting inside of each other, sometimes you don't know where one starts and the other ends. It's a, it's a lesson hard learned on my part in terms of, you know, when I was doing professional coding work, um, it's a thing that took me a while, you know, to, to figure out and kind of overcome. But then, you know, you, you get clever over time, hopefully. And once again, my, my tool is choking here. Maybe because I'm video recording, screen broadcasting <laughs> all at the same time. And it's Friday. So I'm going to name these box one, box two, box three. And then I'm also going to change the, the comments here like this. Oops, that's box two. All right. Now here's what we're going to play with. We're going to go to our CSS style sheet. I'm going to save this HTML document, control S. I'm going to go back to the style sheet and I'm going to start creating styles for those objects. I'm just going to do it right here at the bottom. Um, those were IDs, right? So what character do I need to start with? A hashtag. A hashtag is correct, or a pound sign. Notice this tool will find, as soon as I put the pound sign in, will find all the things with the IDs on my page already. Thank you, Dreamweaver. And then I'm going to put in my curlies. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and pre-create the structure for all of them. So I can play with it. So here's what I want you guys to do is first of all, I want to, to actually pre-declare some sizes and shapes. Okay, so I'm going to do some some, some primitive things. All right, so here, here's what I'm going to do. First of all, for box one, I'm going to set a width for it, and I'm going to say, you know, 400 pixels sounds about right to me. I'm going to put a border around it, and I'm going to go two pixels, um, dotted, and green. I'm also going to put in just a little bit of padding. Let's go... Um, 20 pixels on it. And the other thing I'm going to do is give it a background color. 
and, and the reason I'm doing this is it'll basically allow me to see it on the screen. So box one will be kind of red. And then I'm going to kind of do the same with all of these. So I'm just going to come in here and copy this code, paste it into each one and make tweaks. Okay. So with box two, I'm going to make the width 200. Um, let's make this one solid blue. I use the same padding. I'm going to change the background color on this. Wait, I had the color picker there. Where was it? Yeah, I don't know if my computer's just choking because yeah, normally it would just pop up the box. All right, look, I'm just going to retype it. Yeah, my computer's like, like practically frozen up right now. Well, yeah, I, and, and some very heavy video processing going because I'm screen recording and screens. Yeah, so, so I'm just trying to invoke the, the native color picker. Okay, let's just make that one aqua just to get it over with. Uh, and then let's take this one and make it 100 pixels. Um, two pixels. Uh, let's make this one dashed and red seems good to me. And then here, let's pick a different color. You know, something that's going to be obvious. Oh, we already we already did green, uh, purple. Oh, you know, the other thing I forgot to do is I gave them widths, but what about heights? Can we declare a height? We sure can. So I'm going to declare a height. Got to spell it correctly. Uh, let's make this one. Let's make all of them square for right now. I'll make this one 200 pixels. I don't want to type. I'm lazy. So I'm just copy pasting and adjusting. So I'm, I'm basically creating a bunch of squares. The other thing I want to do is back on my HTML document, I'm saving this for right now. Um, back on the HTML document, come on. There we go. I'm going to actually put in a little bit of content so I know which box I'm looking at. So I'm going to say uh, box one. I just want the text. I don't know why it's being so challenging here. save that also. I'm now going to go back to the browser and take a look at the monstrosity I've created. Close the inspect panel and I'm going to my code example page and we're taking a look. Alright, so there's my box one. There's my box two, and there's my absolutely hideous box three, right? So three different sizes. Now, I want you to notice something. I declared box one to be 400 pixels. However, because it is a block level element, it fills the whole space of the containing element going all the way across the screen. So the next element in the code must appear below it. But to my eye, looking at it, it looks like box two could fix next to it if we wanted to. And box three could probably even fit next to that. And that is actually my goal, right? What if they're all on the same line? But here's the problem. A block level element by design fills the whole space. In order to make it come up, we have to use this special property called float. First, let's uh, 
learn how to do that. So let's go over to the, the PowerPoint and let's talk about what the author's talking about now so then when you see the float thing, you'll totally understand what I'm talking about. In terms of where the stuff appears in a document, there is what we call a normal flow. So if I take a div element, right, so let's say this is a div element and this is a div element, very similar to what I just did. If I have one on one line of code and it's set for block level, we don't mess with it at all, it appears here. The next line of code that appears below it will appear below it. That's the normal flow. If I take and adjust a couple different things, so for example, if I put this code inside that code, so one div exists inside the other, it will appear inside of it. Let's, let's try that to start with. So if I take this div code here, right, and put it inside the other div, And to help see it, you know what is a good idea is always to indent like this. Let's save that and see what it does. Back to the browser and refresh. Okay, so I can put one box inside another. Interesting, right? Right. Why why can I do that? Because it fits for one reason. And I just told it to do it, right? I'm encapsulating it inside of another object. And this is a technique that you can use. Now, I want to keep that encapsulation in place. So I'm going to actually take that box two and, and paste it back in. Save. Let's go back to the browser again. Sorry. My alt tabs aren't going so smoothly today. So I put it back on the screen just so we can see it. Do you guys... When I when I switch screens like this, so here's a shortcut that you guys should know. On Windows, if you want to switch between applications, if I hold down the Alt key and press Tab, it brings up this interface. I'm still holding Alt, by the way, and then I can tab between all my open applications. If I just hit it once, it goes to the last thing I was using. That's once. If I hold it down and keep pressing, I can scroll through. I can also, with my mouse, go directly to the thing I want to go to. Isn't that cool? Yeah, I think so. All right. So we saw normal flow and encapsulation. But sometimes you want to take some content and you want, want it to appear next to something else. So then we start using what we call the float property, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So there are some prerequisites for this. First of all, there has to be enough space for it to fit. So if I want to move box two up here, there's got to be enough room for it for one thing. And you know what? I can already see that there is, right? So here's what I'm going to do. For, block, for box number two in the CSS, I'm going to add something to it. Now I got to be really careful here because I, I, I'm, my, my head's all, all screaming at me already. The box that I have inside the other box, I should probably rename that to box four. Okay. Right. And you know what? If I'm doing that, I probably also need to give it its own styles before I go making these changes because otherwise I'm going to create a real monster. So I'm going to copy whatever I had for box two, paste it back in, name it box four, and that one will stay the same. You guys caught what I just did? That way I can change box two without affecting the other box two. So save that too. But now I'm going to apply to box two, the original box two, the property called float. And what float will do is it would allow this object to move up if there's space for it. So at first I gotta make space for it by making box one small enough. And I'm gonna, you know, basically I got like a choice here of like, you know, two different things. I can float left or I can float right. I'm gonna do float right, which is what they do in the book first. 
save it, and let's go take a look in the browser. Refresh. It floated right. I know what you guys are thinking. It's like, that's not at all what I thought was going to happen. Right? That's not at all what I thought was going to happen. The question becomes why. So here's where your inspect tool comes in super handy when you're trying to work out flow issues like this because this stuff does not often work in the way that you kind of hope it does. And you see how I'm like digging down through the structure here? And now I'm clicking on box one and it's like, oh wait, hold on a second. Box one is still occupying that whole space. I thought I made room for it. So the inspect element tool is priceless here. Absolutely priceless. So I'm trying to float this thing right and you know what, it did, but it didn't move up. You know why? Because I need to take box one, and guess what? I need to float that left first, because otherwise it's going to follow nor normal document flow, regardless of how wide it is. So I'm saving that. And now watch. Box two. But oh my god. Everything else is broken. Because I just broke the normal flow of the document. So what's happening here is all the, all the objects that are sitting below are trying to move into position. I broke the normal flow of the document, so now I have to start adding other stuff in to make everything sit in the right place. Okay, so how do I do that? Everything, when I start putting floats in there, everything that sits below those objects want to also float up now because I broke the flow. So I have to actually do what they call a clear float on the next object that follows. The next object that follows is what? Box three. And so on that one, I'll do a clear. And you notice, what am I clearing? The left float, the right float, I'm going to clear both. Right? I want both of them to stop floating. I'm going to save that. Now watch what happens, folks. Boom. Now we're finally kind of getting the effect we wanted. This is interesting, isn't it? And not what you anticipate will happen. Let's just experiment just a little bit more. I'm going to take that box two, which is floating right, and I'm going to switch it to floating left. Save it. One change at a time, folks. Refresh. Ooh, hey. Interesting. Now, can I get that little box up here? Oh, wait, this one's clear in floats, right? Yeah, it is. It is clear in floats. So, but I want it to float up. In fact, I'm going to actually make it float left. So I'm going to get rid of the clear. I'm already anticipating problems, just so you know. It's not that I'm not anticipating the issues, right? Will that float up now? Yes, but so did everything else. So what's the next object that follows in my code? If I go to my code, what's the object that follows box three? It's the footer. So what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to put the clear both on the footer, wherever my footer is, I know it's in here somewhere, in fact, let's do a control F to find and find footer. There it is. And I'm gonna type clear both, save it, back over, do a refresh, and boom, we're kinda of back to normal. Whenever you put in those floats to move the objects around, and you can do some really kinda of neat little effects with this, Whatever follows those objects, you want them to go back where they're supposed to go, you got to clear the float. And you say clear both, or you clear left and clear right. All right, so that's kind of our quick little thing on floats. These are very important little concepts. 
and when you first start to play with them, they, you can, you'll struggle a little bit. And it's, you know what, it's totally normal. However, what the author does, and I think, and it's probably coming up uh, pretty quickly here, um, is they show you how to do some layouts and how to get the layouts with the basic CSS and HTML, and then you just add in your own stuff to tweak it. All right, so they show you the clear property, right? That's the one I just showed you. Another one that you can use to kind of do the same thing is also the overflow property. Now, what that one is actually intended to do is to allow for stuff to either, like if it fills a content area, to either continue overflowing or you can hide it or whatever, but it's also useful in the same way that the clear is because it breaks floats as well. So that's just something uh, to know. I'm not a huge user of that one personally, but I do know people that do like to use it quite a bit. All right, I think we're at a good logical stop point right now. Let's take a, another five minute, you guys. Five minute break, stand up, walk around, stretch your legs, get a beverage, whatever. Okay, we're back from break and we're gonna move on. Uh, the next thing we're gonna learn about is some uh, a property called display for CSS. And isn't this kind of weird? Look at that first one, display none. Hmm. So wait, I'm gonna put something on the screen and then tell it to not be displayed? Yeah. Okay, so let me explain why you might do that. Sometimes you put things on the screen. For example, some people, if they're trying to break a float, you know, we were just looking at floats, sometimes they put a div in that does clear both and they don't show it on the screen. Isn't that interesting? But it still clears the float. The other thing that people do is sometimes they'll write code to make stuff not visible to start with and then they'll write like some JavaScript for example, so if like you click a button or hover over something, then it shows up. Isn't that interesting? So yeah, you can tell stuff to display, not at all. So let me just, let's just do one, just so you see how cool it is. What, what if we make this box disappear? Box number four. Uh, let's go to our code. That's way at the bottom. So it's got all these properties to it, but I'm gonna say display None. Save it. Let's do a refresh. And there it goes. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's a really good question. If there's words in it, they sure do. Yeah, yeah, you know, Joe's actually correct about that. Strike that comment. So they have a separate CSS property that controls that. Yeah, but that's display none. Um, not that we necessarily don't want to display something, but just keep in mind that it is a technique that uh, people will make something display none and then use JavaScript code to make it display depending on what you're doing on the screen. And we'll... We'll, sh we'll show you how that works when we get to that point. Um, the other thing that you can often do is take something that normally would act as an inline element, meaning it doesn't occupy the whole width of the screen, and make it take up the whole width of the screen. So I can take a block level or an inline element, and they give an example of a hyperlink, and switch it so it does take up the whole screen. Or I can do the converse. I can take a block level element, and make it appear inline. So that also makes room on the screen for things to float up, for example. And that's what they're talking about here. What this is often used for, and, and they're kind of building up to this in the chapter, uh, display inline is often used to do navigation elements. So like they're talking about like list items. A list item in an unordered list is normally filling the whole screen. But if I tell it to display inline, then I can put a bunch of those list items on the same line and turn that unordered list with bullets into a menu. And that's, that's often a technique they use. 
The other uh, thing that happens when you're doing techniques like that is sometimes you use this other option called inline block. And, and read what it says. It says the element with display is an inline display element adjacent to another inline display element, but also can be configured with the properties of block displays, including width and height and padding and margin. And so often when people are doing navigation with list items, they choose inline block so they can control the spacing of those items where normally they wouldn't be able to. So that's kind of an interesting little feature. All right, so as we've been kind of toying around with the stuff that we've been learning, basically so far we've been using this approach, a single column wireframe is what the author's calling it. We have a header, we have our nav, we have an area where we put all our stuff, and then we get a footer. And you know what, that actually works pretty good for a lot of different types of websites. And you might choose to do your whole project that way when it comes down to it. But how about if you wanted to do a two column display? So maybe your navigation, instead of being along the top, moves to the left side. And in fact, if you start doing uh, the case studies for chapter six, you're gonna see with Fish Creek, I think it's Fish Creek, or maybe it's Java Jam, I forget, one of those, they take the navigation off the top and then all of a sudden they move it over to the side just so you see how that's done. Now what's really kind of neat about that is what the author does is they also give you the code that would help you make it. So they show you the basic code in the body section. So you still have a wrapper, right? You have a header, a nav, a main, and a footer. But that doesn't look any different than the regular code, does it? It doesn't. It's the same. It's all about taking the nav and making it what? What do you guess the CSS is? Float left, right? So the next slide does exactly that. So here's the, the thing. In order to go to that form of a layout, they give you some suggested settings for CSS. So you could take this basic HTML code, apply this basic CSS to it. It's all here in text. And notice what they do. The wrapper still kind of stays the same. The header is still the same. When we get to the nav, we give it a width. We float it left, a little bit of padding around it. The main, margin left 100 pixels. That allows for the nav to sit there. And because this is floated left, the main will automatically float up. And then in the footer, we end up having to, uh, it doesn't, they don't have a clear in there? Oh, that's interesting. They don't have a clear in there. But because the main is floating up, apparently the footer will just sit there. In my mind, I would put a clear on it, but you know, that's me. So that allows you to get a two column layout. They show you some other approaches, right? Who says that it has to be uh, like that? Maybe, and you know, and this is the funny thing is when I started doing this stuff, this approach you see on the screen was the more common approach. The nav on the left, and then everything else kind of on the right side. So instead of putting the header all the way across the top, it just pops over to one side. And what they do, once again, is they show you um, kind of like the techniques for that. Now when you're doing navigation in a sidebar, and we have kind of learned this technique already, right? And I've, I've broken it out of the unordered list, personally, you know, because I'm not a huge fan of that. But the unordered list gives you that bullet. And so if you're doing a vertical navigation on the sidebar, th this will work probably just fine, right? Because the normal way that it lays on the screen is one list item after another, so it's perfect. When we started moving um, you know, to that horizontal navigation, it kind of made things a little challenging for some old school coders. But one thing that people do with vertical navigation often is they decide to actually put in this special style here that does what? List style, type, none, that removes the bullet. So it's still an unordered list, but it gets rid of the little bullet in front of each line. The other thing that they did, if you notice, they did on the navigation anchor links, the links themselves, they chose text decoration none, and that was something I did on mine early on, if you guys remember, and that removes the underline under the link. And I think that looks pretty slick too. I always caution people though, when you start doing stuff like that, 
you still kind of have to make it somehow apparent to the user that it's still a link, because otherwise they might miss it. That's just you know my handy tip. All right, then you can switch to horizontal navigation. So hold on a second. I can take that same unordered list and learning some of that those display elements that we just learned and some of these techniques. We can take that same unordered list and still have it behave like this, right? Which kind of looks like what I created, right? So we put list style type none, bullets are gone. The links have text decoration none, so no underlines. We also put padding on the right so that the next menu item doesn't bump right up against it. So it's moved over a little bit. And then notice the list items themselves also are displayed in line. So they don't behave like blocks anymore and they can all appear on one line. So this is a really common technique that you see on some websites. So a lot of menu builders, right, and, and HTML applications will still use an unordered list. And here's the why. Let's say your page breaks and the CSS doesn't load. You still have this bulleted list of navigation items that, you know, if you have no CSS, it'll look okay. So that, that's kind of a, the thinking there. Um, I'm more of the mindset, though, that I like the approach that I use where I don't, I bypass all this, but this is a good technique to know and understand. And I think some of the uh, case studies make you actually do that. Um, and I don't remember exactly which one it was, but all right. Let's talk about this thing now, this concept called pseudo classes. And um, we should be able to get through the rest of this slideshow before we leave the class. But a lot of times when we're working with uh, links, and, and this is where it becomes really pretty darn useful, folks. Uh, a pseudo class is something that is not actually a class that we add to a tag but it's an implied class that's built into CSS3. So let me explain what that means. Notice how we um, add to each one of these uh, anchor tags a colon and then this, you know, this you know, style thing that we're uh, applying there, the pseudo class. And so we're saying if an anchor tag is a link, color it like this. If it's been visited, color it like this. If we hover over it, color it like this. If we're actively clicking on it, color it like this. And if it has focus, and that's kind of a, a little higher end concept, meaning that we've set the focus to that item usually with JavaScript, color it like this. All right. So what basically that means is if you go to um, and I'm trying to think, maybe I should go to my launch page because we were kind of like working on that before. Right? And I know that I visited all of these links, right? Because they're purple now. So it shows that they've been visited. Otherwise, they would be blue. But notice as I click and hold, that's called active. So the default color for active before I release it is red. Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? There's also a thing, your focus, sometimes you'll land on a page and it'll kind of be highlighted and it'll have like a little box around it. But I'm going to show you a way to trigger that that you might not normally anticipate. So when you're on a web page, click usually somewhere up near the top and then use your tab key and watch what happens. You see what happened? How that first link highlighted and I press my tab key again. It goes to the second link. So with this HTML has built into it a pseudo class for links for when I am focusing on it that it highlights it with a border. Some browsers will put a little tiny little dashed line around it. Some browsers will color it and some browsers will, will do a border like this, like a you know, more profound border. But that's focus. What's interesting is, is a lot of times when you write applications for screen and the best example I can think of is like online banking for me, right? Because I, I deal with a couple different financial institutions, you know, one for my mortgage, one for my, you know, checking or whatever. And on a couple of them, when you go to their website, you can just go to the website and start typing in your username because the box where you type has focus. And the programmer designed it that way so that when you go to the site, you can just start typing. 
on some sites you have to actually go through the process of moving your mouse, click in the box, and then it has focus. That's, so that's what focus is. Now in terms of a practical standpoint, and this is just an opinion, mind you, um, I usually don't take it beyond the hover stage. I usually just have the link, whatever it is, and then a hover state for it so when somebody hovers they know it's a link. If you want to apply all the others, the, the real important takeaway here is if you do apply these, you have to make sure you apply them in this order if you want to color everything differently because sometimes they, they won't work if you don't put them in that order. It's not an order by accident, by the way. So let me show you how I would do my navigation menu. And I think I already have a nav A, right? And I already decided to make it color antique white. So what I want to do is I want to create a hover effect for my menu. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say nav A colon hover. And you know what? I'm going to just keep it really simple. I'm just going to say color um, red. I, I just don't want to spend a lot of time on it. And I'm going to save it. So it's going to apply to all my navigation menus. And then if I go back to my Mr. Robot page here and do a reload, all right? Now watch what happens with my menu links. Isn't that cool? Very simple effect. Now, I didn't declare whether it's been visited or not. Like, I really don't want a different color for my menu if it's visited. Who cares, right? I think that makes it look ugly. Maybe for a link on the page, that's okay, but I don't think it's good for a menu. I mean, this, these are opinion things, right? I also don't care that if I'm clicking on it, that it changes color. Maybe you do. That's up to you as a designer to choose those things. But I think it's really helpful when you start removing underlines from links and they're not blue that you do create hover effects um, to show people that they're active menu items really really simple code but really effective right hopefully you guys agree all right let's move on all right so what the author recommends is that you do this now this is kind of what I did except I'm not a huge fan of also adding a pseudo class for a link because an anchor tag already is a link. This is my thinking. So from a practical standpoint, I see a lot of web designers not ever saying a link. From a formal standpoint, you're kind of supposed to do it, but from a practical standpoint, to me it doesn't make sense and a lot of people agree. So this is just like practical real world knowledge, okay? But either way, I, I kind of agree with the fact that a link one color is good, and a hover of a different color is good. It just shows the user that it actually is a link. Otherwise, their only other tip that it's a link is that the pointer changes to a finger. And it depends on your browser. It might be a little different in other operating systems. All right. Let's move on to this topic now. Now, I've already kind of done this on my website. It says header text image replacement. All right. So, in other words, what some people do in, in a header of, of a HTML page is they actually use text in the header. So like Mr. Robot and they'll try to get a font that looks really cool. But you know, I decided that the only way I'm going to get that Mr. Robot font is to actually have an image of it. So I'm not putting text in my header. I have an image in my header. And this is what they're talking about. There's some pros and cons to it. And that, this is really what he's kind of trying to point out. So if you are going to use text in the header for let's say your logo and let's say your company has actually a specific font and it's not too difficult to mimic what the logo is by actually just using CSS styles and finding the right font, wonderful. But I'm going to tell you what, most, for most companies it's not that way. They get you know graphics people that do it and there's certain colors and sizes and relative positioning and all that kind of stuff that happens. And so what they're recommending basically is that you want to do some adjustments to get it to look right so here's what they're doing they're actually putting a combo of the two things they're creating an h1 and they're applying a font to it I'm gonna tell you I, I think that font is hideous that's just that's just an opinion and some of you might think it's cool that's the papyrus font right maybe if you're like trying to I don't know do like an Egyptian website or something, maybe it's okay. But they're just giving the example. 
The other thing that they're doing is that in the background, they're using an image. So they're kind of getting an image and a logo all at the same time. So they're doing a little bit of a text indent to move the text over. They're also making it so the text does not wrap, so it doesn't like go down to the second line if somebody squeezes in the screen. And the overflow hidden also prevents that from happening. So it will stay in that format. That's, that's what their goal is. I'm not a huge fan of that approach. If I have like a visual logo that I want to use, I would much rather opt to have the actual image. They're just showing you a technique. So that's just a, a personal thing. Uh, if you want to try um, dropping it in, and, and the other aspect of this is sometimes if you have uh, an actual image that's in there and it's not loading, you might want to have a fallback, and that's what that link is. If you want to follow the link and read up on it, uh, that's all on you. Now we're going to learn about positioning, and positioning is a pretty important concept too because it helps us do layouts. And they talk about the position property and the, the four basic settings that you'll use for it. And I'm going to caution you and, and coach you a little bit on this, but ultimately you guys have to play with it and figure out what works for you um, when you're doing a, a layout. All right, so there's four values that we can set. And static, notice, is the default value. It doesn't need to be declared. The only reason that you would find yourself declaring it is if you are dynamically changing the code, usually with JavaScript. So if you have JavaScript doing something to your page and then you want it to go back to what it was, you can reset a style with uh, back to static. Now, what's fascinating about that is this is giving you a little bit of a clue. One thing that JavaScript can do is it can change the stuff on the page, the actual HTML, so it can create and destroy HTML, and it can also control the CSS of the HTML dynamically. And that's what makes web pages often look really cool and behave really cool. Right. Another thing that you can do is you can do what we call fixed. Now, a really good example is fixed is you go to some websites and you log in. And then all along the top, they'll have a toolbar that's always there. Often that's fixed positioning or maybe a footer that's always sitting there, that's fixed positioning. So no matter how you scroll or move around or sh change the screen, it's always there. Then we have the uh, other uh, two, and these are ones that you want to use with some caution, because they can really break your layouts, just like floats do. The first one is what we call relative. So when I say relative, we can actually take an object and put it on the screen and declare an X and a Y point on a coordinate system as to where it actually sits relative to where it's supposed to be. Let me demonstrate. Okay, so this is the, the best way to understand it is just to see it in action because otherwise you'll, you might never really latch on to it. So I'm going to begin this box one. We saw how that was sitting, right? Uh, and I'm going to say position and I'm going to say relative. So relative to where it was normally supposed to be. And then I'm going to say top 20 pixels, left, oh, let's make it 40 pixels. And hopefully we have enough room on the screen. And let me just do a really quick explanation here. People that are online or listening to the video won't won't see this, so I'm drawing on the board. But on the screen, I'll try to show it on the screen when I go back too. When you're looking at a screen, there's a coordinate system that's built in to your browser window. Usually when you learn math, you learn a Cartesian coordinate system, and this is zero, zero, right? This is the y, this is the x. So if I plot uh, x zero, y zero, it's right in the middle. And then if you go a positive value, go to the right on x, positive value of y, you go that way. Okay, computer screen is different. This is zero, zero. The top left corner, zero, zero, right? When I go x, I go to the right, that doesn't change. So x is right, y is down. Here's, a, here's another interesting one. 
There's also a Z. Z, guess what, comes out in three-dimensional space. When you add Z, and there's this thing called Z index, you can layer stuff on top of each other in space. So the greater the Z index, the more it comes out in front of the other objects. The flat part of the screen is a Z of zero. Okay? All right, so when I say on the screen here, so if we imagine that this is the browser window, zero, zero is up here, X goes across and gets bigger, Y goes down and gets bigger. So when I say top 20, I'm going to move 20 pixels down from where it normally would be from the top. And from the left, I'm going to move 40 pixels over from where I would normally be. Question you might ask in your head, can I go bottom and right? Guess what? Yes, you absolutely can. But top and left tend to be the ones that most people think of because we think relative to the zero point. And because this is position relative, it's relative to where it normally would appear. That's really the key to it. So let's save that. So this is box one. This is where it normally would appear. Watch the refresh. Also watch what it did to the float. Notice how it broke the float, yep. in a sense? The other two objects are still going where they normally would go, but they are disregarding the positioning. Oh my god. So you, well, you can look at it two different ways. You can go, oh wow, that's really cool. I can layer stuff. Yeah, that's the one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, oh my god, I totally broke this. This looks hideous. And then you end up adding margins and paddings and things like that to move the objects over so they sit where you want them. So that's relatively positioned relative to where it normally would be. Let's do something even more radical. I'm going to take that box number four, which is sitting inside right now, and on that one, I'm going to do a different kind of positioning. This is the last of them, and this is the one you should be the most cautious with. Okay, so position absolute. All right. Once again, I'm going to declare a top, and I'm going to make it, I don't know, 100 pixels, just shooting a number out there. And um, you know what? Let's go right this time, right? Uh, 200 pixels. I want you to think about this really carefully. Absolute positioning ignores where the object's supposed to be, ignores everything on the page, and is relative to the whole browser window. So what this is going to do is it's going to take that box wherever it's sitting right now and it's going to go 100 pixels from the top of the browser window and 200 pixels over from the right. Watch what happens when you see this in action. Now this is kind of cool and kind of scary all at the same time. And, and you guys are like, Oh, uh, that's not really anything uh, I expected. Well, you know what's happening is that box four is sitting inside of what? Box one, right? So now it's being absolutely positioned relative to box one. So watch when I take it out of that structure. So I have to go to my HTML to do that. So I'm going to just pull it out of the div. And you know what? It doesn't matter where I put it on the page at this point because it's absolutely positioned. Save back to the browser, do a refresh. Now, how do you like that? Okay, here's a little tip. A lot of times when you go to websites and you put up those obnoxious ads that pop up in front of your screen, people in the industry, in the marketing industry, call them AP divs. Absolutely positioned div elements because they're always overlays, you know? And they jump out in front of your stuff, and it doesn't matter how I resize my screen, you know, it tries to stay in that same relative position, but it's relative to the browser window. Now, you can leverage this, folks, right? You can do stuff with it that's kind of cool, that makes your page look magical. Like, for example, you could make it display none to start with, and then you hit a button, and this box pops up right in the middle, over at the top of everything. Hmm. Just idea, I'm just giving you ideas. So we're kind of unlocking a whole bunch of doors today 
with possibilities of things to do. I think that's absolutely hideous, and I wouldn't do it in, you know, in a million lifetimes. Another thing that you, know, that you might want to think about is if I, let's say, change my positioning to fixed, but I set the thing to be either at the very top of the screen or the bottom, those are like the toolbars I'm talking about when you go to some websites and they persist, regardless of what you do on the, on the screen. So let's move on. All right, give some examples, fixed positioning, and they're, they're doing that with the navigation. They show the relative positioning. I think we got that one pretty good. The absolute positioning, where it was relative to the browser. So I think we got all those. All right. Uh, we're, we're in the home stretch here, folks, so we're almost done. Um, one thing that the author does want you to remember is like the same way that we have an HTML validator on W3 schools, there's also a CSS validator. That's the link to it. So if you want to make sure that your CSS is correct, you know, because what happens is if your CSS code isn't correct, it can break your page too. So uh, it's always a good idea uh, to, to check it. All right. Let's talk about some of the structural elements that we've learned so far, right? We've learned about the header element. In the, in the old days, we used to create divs and put ID header on it or class header on it. Uh, we do the same thing with nav and main, and then they got smart and they said, you know what, everybody does that, so why don't we just create them into tags? And it's like, okay, sounds good, let's do it. Okay, and so they did. Um, we also learned about the footer element. All right, so I think we got those pretty good. However, there's a few other ones that we haven't played with yet um, that as you start to do the exercises in this chapter for chapter six, they're gonna in start introducing them. And these are considered once again, what we call semantic uh, markup tags, meaning that their aim is to describe what you're putting inside of them. So when you're putting together a page, we still draw a lot from the print world in terms of the conception of the layout, because the print world came first. And we think about these things and think about what they mean, an aside. So you're reading a magazine, and then there's this little box off to the side, that has some little extra content in it. It might be a map or an ad or a, you know, a little blurb about the author or something like that. That's called an aside. The section take the content area of the page and break it into categories, right? So like, for example, I might have a section on, I don't know, the history of something. And I might have a section on the biography of the author, right? It's just to break it into categories. The beauty of it is, is it encapsulates content and allows you also to individually style that content based upon what's in it. Then we have the article element, which I mean, that's kind of, um, I think pretty intuitive, right? So like if you were doing some sort of content on the screen, it's got a lot of written words in it, that might be considered an article, so that would, would be where your words would go. To see the, the, the logical construct and the meaning that goes behind it. They also have, uh, an element called time. This is kind of interesting. It's an inline display element where if you were adding, and I don't know if they have, like right here they have a date, you know, and the, the whole point of it is if you're putting a date on a page, you may as well put it in the time tag because that way if a, if a search engine is parsing it and reading the page, it tells it that, well, this is obviously some sort of a timestamp and it has special meaning. And that's a really key thing that happened when HTML5 came around, is that the tags that were being created, the new ones, were intended to have meaning so that somebody looking at the content in a, on a code level instantly knows what this is. You don't have to guess what they meant by the cryptic div name that they used. I know that it's a timestamp because I put it in the time tag. I don't think I need to demonstrate that one, but that's, kind of interesting. Another important thing that you might want to consider, you know, I'm going to say that we're probably safely in the zone now where most computers that might be running old browsers we don't have to worry about, but let's say that you know that you're coding for an environment where somebody's using an antiquated browser. This most likely will happen on an enterprise level where they're using old equipment, like maybe a manufacturing floor or something. Yes? Yeah. 
like yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and sometimes, you know, the reason companies use those old browsers is because they spent a lot of money building applications that work in them and don't work in the new browsers. Right? So one thing that a lot of designers would do as kind of a fail-safe, so if you create an HTML5 page and then you try to render it on an old browser that doesn't know what HTML5 is, all the brand new tags that have been created, they don't know what to do with it. So in order to make them even render on the screen, you have to list them all, comma separated, and say display block. So you might encounter some old HTML5 C or CSS code actually where you see this thrown in at the top and you're like, why the hell are they doing this? That just allows the browser to read a tag it doesn't know and still put it on the screen. And this should also give you a little bit of tip. That also means you can create your own tags with their own unique names and display them on the screen by just saying display block. It's not considered safe though. But this is just a fail safe for old browsers. Um, your exercises might make you do it. I'm at the point now where I don't think about it unless I'm really worried about the environment that I'm coding for. Most consumer machines won't even run those old browsers anymore. So, all right. <clears throat> Some tips at this point. What, you can choose a class or you're going to choose an ID. Always remember this about these. A class, you start with a dot when you put it in your CSS. A class allows itself to be replicated on a page many times. So I, if I have 20 paragraphs on a page and I want half of them to have a certain font and color, I can apply that class to all of them. Classes also allow you to apply multiple classes. So you can actually have a bunch of different class declarations and when you put a class thing on a tag, I can say uh, blue, uh, you know, fancy, whatever my different classes are and I can string them. I just put spaces in between them and I can apply multiple classes to an object. It's a, it's a design technique. With an ID, an ID must be unique to an object. So an ID, there can't be two objects on a page with the same ID. Not that it'll necessarily break, but you can't predict what's gonna happen. Especially when you apply advanced positioning techniques and more importantly, JavaScript. Because if you write JavaScript to let's say like make something appear or disappear, and you got two objects with the same ID, maybe you're making something disappear you don't want to. You know, so, and then the other problem is, is if you start breaking some of those rules, browsers go into what we call quirks mode, which means you don't know what the rules are, you don't know how to follow them, uh, we're just gonna do whatever we want. And that's dangerous from a design standpoint and a programming standpoint. All right, that covers the whole chapter, folks. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in there, there's a lot of heavy material to pick up and some of it's going to take a little bit of uh, experimentation to kind of wrap your head around. The, the case studies in chapter six are designed to play with these a little bit so you kind of see where it's going. Um, but when you start working on your own designs, feel free to experiment. Do like what I did, create a bunch of like generic divs, throw them on a page, move them around, see how they behave. And you might come up with some really cool stuff. So have fun with it, I think, is kind of the most important thing. Um, and that's it for today, folks.